Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to start with a little song. We're not doing too much singing these days. Yeah. I'm going to take every opportunity I can get. Maybe you've heard this one before, just a little, um, a little Jamaican song about the Lord. Uh, but it just, it'll fill our hearts. It'll just kind of open us up with great joy. So if you know it, sing along, okay? J O Y joy, joy in the Holy Ghost. J O Y joy, joy in the Lord. J O Y joy, joy in the Holy Ghost. J O Y joy, joy in the Lord. And that is what the Holy Spirit is to us. He just fills us with his joy. And so it's a real gift to come and speak about him tonight. I have to be honest, I was pretty tempted to come up here and be like, the Holy Spirit is a mystery. That's it. <laughs> what can I say about the Holy Spirit? He's, he's God I, and he's a spirit. So <laughs> where do I go from there? But, um, but I prayed to him and uh, I think he gave us a few things to just spend some time on tonight. So the first thing I was thinking, and it was really great that actually um, we, there's Jesus, I'm so glad he's here with us. The first thing I was, I was glad that we prayed the Apostles' Creed tonight, um, because I was thinking about the creed, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but you're going through the creed, and it's great, you're slow, you're moving through the Father, you're moving through the Son, and then you get to, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, community saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, amen. And you're like, uh, did I really, do I believe that? I just kind of spouted all that off as if it's just something you tack on to the end of the Apostles' Creed. But we just talked about the third person of the Holy Spirit and his presence in the church and in the world. Um, so do I, do I believe in the Holy Spirit? Do I really stake my daily claim on the fact that he is truly present in my life, working powerfully, and not only in my life, but in the world, in every life around us? Do I really, when I say I believe in the Holy Spirit, do I stand faithfully beside that and believe that he's doing amazing things in my life? And it just gave me um, a pause, a pause for reflection on that. Um, will I slow down? Will I really say those words with everything in my heart and with the faith that I truly want to have? Um, in Lent, um, I know we don't really want to think back to that because we're in Easter, but we can learn a lot and it's good to reflect on what happened in Lent. And the Holy Spirit was very present during Lent. Um, he was present the whole time. I just didn't realize it until the last week. And maybe that's been your experience as well. I had my plan. I knew what I was going to do. And actually it had to do with just having that faith of standing on God. And I utterly, utterly failed through the entire thing until Holy Week until Holy Week when I was still failing. But the thing that I did not fail in was that when I was laid out on the ground, I turned to him and I said, I need you. I need you in my life. I need you to do something inside of me to pick me up and move me on. And I got up again. Like when Jesus falls down along the way of the cross, he gets up again. It's that perfect example. And so the Holy Spirit was there and he was there the whole time with me, but just waiting for me to say, it's you it's you. And he picked me right up and I could experience the new life that he gave me and the new fruits that he poured into me and allowed just to flower in my life. And um, so that was just a really beautiful um, experience of the Holy Spirit in a very recent time. And he just continues to pour himself forward. And now we're heading towards Pentecost, which means just he's going to be so much more present in all of our prayers and in the liturgy. So it's really exciting. When I was praying to the Holy Spirit, I said, you know, where, where do I go? Where do I go to find out about you and share some great things about you with everybody? And he's like, how about the book that I wrote? The Bible. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, so I did. I went to the Bible. And there is so much in the Bible about the Holy Spirit, which shouldn't surprise us because it's all about God and his love for us. But I think um, I always thought, gosh, I don't know how present he is in the Old Testament. They never talk about him. And then he's revealed with the Holy Trinity. But even then, Jesus, you know, promises him at the Last Supper. And then it's kind of the end of the Bible. But actually, there's so much to it. There's so much to it. And um, when I was reading, I opened the to the very first page and there was the Holy Spirit. And I opened to the very last one and there was the Holy Spirit. And so I just asked him to pick out some various scriptures in here just to guide us in coming to know him better. 
but I want to start at the very beginning at Genesis. And this is what we hear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Moving over the face of the waters, God present from the beginning, present in creation, in creating us, moving over the waters. I love the word hovering because hovering, you stay there. And so the Holy Spirit's with us. He's been with creation from the beginning and we're the pinnacle of creation. So he's with us, hovering over us, living in us, actually. St. Paul tells us we are temples of the Holy Spirit, temples of the Holy Spirit, a living place, a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And this all begins at our baptism, when those waters are poured over our forehead and we are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And now we have his life in us. The life of the Holy Spirit, the new life, the life of Jesus Christ in us. St. Paul breaks this down just a little bit for us because to have the life of Christ means we're going to live his entire life in us. We're going to have the entire Paschal mystery. Everything about him is going to be lived in us. And St. Paul says in Romans, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who are with us in mass, you heard in that we were hearing in the homily about Jesus who completely paid our death debt. He just totally took it away by his love and by his life in us. And so that's what we experience in our baptism. We die with Christ and then rise again. You go into the waters and out of the waters. We, we live that total life of Christ, and that's what it is to have the Holy Spirit in us. It's his spirit that's living in us. So therefore, we can move forward and live this life that Christ has lived and be his presence in the world. Now, how powerful is this life? How powerful is God? I recently heard a really amazing story, and I want to share it with you because I think it's a really good illustration of the power of Christ and, and the Holy Spirit in our lives, living in our lives and in our hearts. Maybe many of you are aware of the Shroud of Turin. And this is the shroud that we uh, believe was the shroud wrapped around Jesus when he um, was placed in the tomb. And they've done all kinds of studies on it throughout the years. And just amazing things have come from it, um, just really proving everything that we know about Jesus Christ. And one of the most amazing things I just heard the other day was um, how the image would have gotten on there. And they've tried to replicate that many, many times. And they're unable to actually, to actually replicate that because it's just so amazingly there. <laughs> and what they found, they did the mathematical explanations and whatever they needed to do to figure this out, that they needed 34,000 trillion watts of electricity to imprint the image that's on the Shroud of Turin. 34,000 trillion. And the story that I heard is that if you took all the electricity in the United States and stuck a huge plug into the wall and sucked up all that energy, and by the way, they'd have to turn off their coffee pots, not their kettles. That's the difference here between America and England. Um, all that energy would be into that plug. That's still not enough energy to make that 34,000 trillion watts in order to imprint that image on there. That's amazing. And you know what? That's who's in us. That's the power of the resurrection. That's the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So we are walking through this world with 34,000 trillion watts equal to power within us, which means we have something to stand on, which means we have a rock to stand on, which means we have the spirit of God alive in us and we can live in, in trust and we can live in courage and we can live in great joy. And that was the power that came to me in Lent, actually. <laughs> That's why I got up off the ground. <laughs> so we can go through every single day and, and embrace that power and allow the Lord to just work in our hearts and to, to bring us to that place. And how do we know that the Holy Spirit comes to us? Well, Jesus promised him to us. 
Again, if you were here in Mass, you heard Father speak about Jesus as the advocate. And Jesus says at the Last Supper, it's recorded in the Gospel of John, multiple times in the time that he is speaking to the um, apostles, giving them encouragement, instruction, telling them to hold on until everything happens and you will see I am with you. You're going to be okay. I promise I will send you another advocate. I will send you the Holy Spirit. I will send you the spirit of truth, he says in there. He promises to send this person. If I go away, then I can send him because they are one in the same, one in the same. Because Jesus went away, we're not without. The Holy Spirit is with us. And so he promises that. And so we hear after um, the resurrection in the Gospel of Luke, we know we have many different resurrection stories that give us a fuller picture of what happened. But what Luke recorded was this. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And what happened? We know nine days later, Pentecost happened. And they were clothed with the Holy Spirit. The tongues of fire came upon them, and they were absolutely filled with the Spirit of God to the point of just praising him. I love in the, um, it, uh, the Easter vigil, it says the walls shook. The walls shook with the praise of the people. And they went out, and they preached the gospel, and they spoke the truth in all languages so that all could hear. They had courage, they had strength, they had the Lord in them, and they spoke of the love and the forgiveness that he speaks about in here, and the healing, and we heard a lot about that today, and the new life and the salvation. But Pentecost continues. It wasn't just the one-time thing. That was the first, the birth of the church, but it continues in our own lives. We have the great gift of confirmation when the Holy Spirit comes to us in fullness, in fullness, in order to enable us to do things for God, to live his life in this world. And uh, Jesus tells us, ask and pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit to come. When he was speaking, he said, um, you know, if a, if a child asks his father for a piece of bread, he's not going to give him a serpent. How much more will the father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And I want you to pay attention to the words of when the Holy Spirit comes because it gives us a good indication of how present he is in our lives and how full he is in our lives. These are the words that are used in scripture. Upon, descend, meaning to come down or come into, clothed, filled, and here's my favorite, outpouring. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he's poured into our hearts. And this, this transforms us. This brings us holiness and sanctification, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. The works of God are, are the works of the three people of the Trinity, but they, we, we give sanctification to the Holy Spirit to make us holy, to make this world holy, to make creation holy for God, for his glory, for his love. Um, when I was little, um, I in mass, uh, there were the bells. And at the epiclesis, when the priest puts his hands over the, um, to invoke the Holy Spirit over the gifts, and then again at the consecration when it's held up, is when you would hear the bells. I could never see the bell ringer. So I really thought the bells were from heaven. And I, I figured they were because I knew God was coming from heaven down into the bread. And it no longer was just bread and wine, but it became the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's an incredible transformation. It has its own word, transubstantiation, a huge transformation. But that's what happens to us too. Listen out for the bells when the Holy Spirit comes upon you because you're being transformed. He's filling your heart with that, that same power. He's bringing that Christ life to you and allowing his life to flourish within you. And he makes us new. He makes us new. He promises us. In the book of the apocalypse, he's talking and he's sitting upon the throne because we know that our God is victorious. So he's sitting upon the throne and he says, behold, I make all things new. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, 
and he shall be my son. I will be his God and he shall be my son. What is this water of life? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is giving him to us, promises to give him to us. He's filling us, outpouring upon us with his spirit. And because of that, God says, I will be their God and he shall be my son. And if we are son and daughter, then he is our father. And it's in the Holy Spirit that we know we can say that. And that is something to stand on. I know in the women's session, we heard a lot about just identity and truth. I'm not sure if that's what you were hearing in the men's session, but it's the truth for you too. Our identity is in the Lord. And that Holy Spirit living in us speaks that truth so we can say, Abba, Father, and claim that and stand on that rock and stand with faith that that is the truth. And if we really have that spirit in us, if we're being filled that powerfully with that 34,000 trillion power of God inside of us, that outpouring that Jesus promised that the Father and the Son are pouring upon us, then we can actually do what God has asked of us. At the end of the Gospel of Mark, on the day of the Ascension, when Jesus was going back to the Father, he gave these commands to the apostles, and of course, they were to be um, lived out in the church. So each one of us are called to be living these out. And this is what he said. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Wow. You read that the first time and you're like, mm -mm, I don't think I'm going to be picking up anything. But the Holy Spirit makes it possible that we can live in his power in this world. And so we don't need to fear anything. Nothing needs to get in the way of his power, his love, his truth, being present in the world and being present through his sons and daughters. And I was just reflecting a little bit on these, like how are these manifested in our life? And these are actual things that you can do, that the Holy Spirit is going to continue to transform your heart to bring you to a place where you can pray for others to the point of laying on hands and have true healing happening where you can forgive others to the point of reconciliation with enemies, where you can confess the faith despite persecution and rejection, even from your family and friends, and where you will be a witness to others, even to the point of martyrdom. Total, complete love. The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, which is so powerful, it's a person. And that's the power that's poured into our lives. And that is why we can go forward proclaiming the kingdom. And that takes us to the end of the book of the Holy Spirit. When we go to the end of the Bible, the very last page in Apocalypse, one of the last few lines, and it speaks about the spirit and the bride, and we are the bride. We are the church who is the bride of Christ. And in union with the Holy Spirit, we cry, come, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who is thirsty, come. Let him who desires take the water of life, the Holy Spirit, without price. Come, Lord Jesus. And so we just pray now one of the beautiful prayers to the Holy Spirit. It's called Veni Sancte Spiritus, and maybe you've heard it in song form, but I'm just going to read the prayer. I just really want you to open your heart and to invite the Holy Spirit in, allow him to do each of these things for you and to just be your life. Holy Spirit, Lord of life, from your clear celestial height, your pure beaming radiance give. Come, O Father of the poor, Come with treasures that endure. Come, O light of all who live. You of all consolers best, visiting the troubled breast, true refreshing peace bestow. You in toil are comfort sweet, pleasant coolness in the heat, solace in the midst of woe. 
light immortal, light divine, visit now these hearts of thine, and our inmost being fill. If you take your grace away, nothing pure in us will stay, all our good is turned to ill. Heal our wounds, our strength renew, on our dryness pour your dew, wash the stains of guilt away. Bend the stubborn heart and will, melt the frozen, warm the chill, guide the steps that go astray. You, on those who evermore confess you and still adore, in your sevenfold gifts descend. Give them comfort when they die, give them life with you on high, give them joys that never end. Amen. <laughs>